Very good. Thank you. One other announcement I was going to make for those not here that are watching. I don't even know if anybody is watching online. Uh, but we have a we have our cords. <laughs> if you recall last week, we have our cord that goes from RCA to XLR to TRS to TRRS. And uh, again, I'm not sure if you guys are hearing this in English or Japanese or some other uh, uh, strange language, but uh, we assume that that is all working. And then we obviously have another or another camera kind of involved as well. And uh, so anybody that is watching, if you have any complaints, <laughs> I guess you'll have to wait till next week. <laughs> <laughs> at this point, I guess it is what it is. Um, but we want to look at uh, no, uh, Numbers chapter 17 here as we uh, continue on in, in our series. Ultimately, what are you thinking? What is it that uh, uh, controls our mind? How is it that our mind controls us at times? And the question that we kind of want to continue to ask ourselves this week, what are we thinking? I want to read this chapter. It's kind of a relatively short chapter. Uh, and then we'll start with the word of prayer. So let's, Numbers chapter 17, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod, according to the house of their fathers, of all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the end of Levi, or the rod of Levi. For one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, for each, for each prince one according to their father's houses, even twelve rods, and the rods of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds and blossomed blossoms and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels, that thou shalt quit taking away their murmuring from me, or quite take away, that they die not. And Moses did so as the Lord commanded him, so did he. The children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Whosoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Shall we be consumed with dying? Before we dive into those 13 verses, let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the testament, the example of the children of Israel, uh, many times in a negative way, but even in, in the negative ways, we can learn from them and and adjust our direction, direct, adjust our feet accordingly. And I pray that you be honored as we look to your word. I pray again that you allow me to decrease so that you, again, would increase here this morning, that the message will be clear, that we'd be able to live it out in our lives. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have today to be together uh, in your word. And we give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Looked at a, a couple aspects of our, our thinking here this morning. We want to look at the uh, uh, mindset of, of the lingering doubt. Last Sunday, we had our uh, business meeting, I already mentioned, after the morning service, and, and I think we accomplished much in that business meeting. But what I was, uh, I don't want to use the word proud of, but one thing that I thought was well worthy of note was, number one, that the morning message was done by 1120. Number two, that our business meeting was done by noon. I think those are records on both accounts, and, and I, could say, I could ask this with a show of hands, how many think that I will be done that quickly today? <laughs> and by the lack of hands, I can tell you that there is lingering doubt even here this morning uh, as uh, we consider that, that reality. You know how often I think we, we know that God is a powerful God, do we not? We know that he has endless might, endless ability but there are times in our life where, come what may, whatever the circumstances are, financial, medical, uh, 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 emotional, whatever the need is in our life, we may have some lingering doubt in regards to, will God or can God meet this need? Can he bring me through this? Uh, can we use the word successfully? Um, and we have those lingering doubts. We could even go even so personal as to say this, have you ever had a doubt that says, I'm just not sure that God can use 
me, even through this situation. Uh, the story is, is told of a, a particular child at a, a summer camp uh, that had a great impact on that camp. Uh, the problem was that the initial part of this week, of that week, he, he himself was being greatly impacted. For he, he had, let me quick, he had spastic paralysis, which meant that he had a hard time controlling his muscles and as well a hard time even speaking. And uh, as kids will often do, it meant he was the brunt of probably too many jokes, too much ridicule. And uh, when he would ask a question, as far as amongst the kids, uh, they would answer his question in the same mannerisms and, and speech that, that he asked the question. Now, as a side note, and I'm, I'm going to go completely against the political correctness, I'm certainly not in favor of a bullying, as, as the word is these days. But you know, there was a day that um, I would dare say all of us face resistance, if we're not growing up. And uh, when, when kids made fun of us, it was either a means of complete defeat or it was a means of rising above it. And uh, I do fear that in our, our certain current affairs that uh, there's a lot of children that will be facing adulthood that have never understood how to rise above their circumstances. And uh, I think in you know, some ways we are doing some harm to that next generation. In other ways, I do agree that there are times where, uh, cool it, we've had enough. Uh, but I, I'm, I, I just think there's some situations here that are, are perhaps not good for our kids in the, in the coming generations. But nonetheless, as far as this camp kid goes, almost as a, uh, a joke, every camp, uh, every cabin had you do a short devotion each evening. Uh, in other words, for the whole camp. So, you know, first night, your cabin comes up with somebody who's going to give a devotional. Second night, this cabin and that cabin and, that, and so on and so forth. Well, when it came time for this kid's cabin to give the devotional, the other kids in his cabin mockingly picked him to give the devotional, knowing this kid can't hardly say three words in a row without stuttering and, and getting embarrassed and, and perhaps even crying. But almost as just further harassment, they, they picked him. And the night came for he to stand up before the entirety of the camp, not just his cabin, all the cabins, and uh, give a... A devotional and with his his body and his, his muscles kind of acting sporadically and uh, his voice uh, not cooperating as his brain was trying to get it to do so he stood up and he said something along these lines Jesus loves me me and I I I love him and that's all he said. But a majority of the kids in that camp had their hearts broken for the, perhaps the first time in their lives. And it was said by camp counselors that they never had a night where more decisions were made from a devotional from a child who only spoke, what, seven words. And many wound up being in the ministry for years later who would go back to that very night of a spastic paralysis kid who gave a seven word devotional and it changed their lives forever you know there's a lot of times in our own life we say god can't use me we have lingering doubt god can't use me my circumstance my abilities my uh, uh, uh whatever it is uh, there's no way that god can use me i can tell you this my parents can attest to this uh when i was in high school my pastor first asked me to preach I told my dad, I can't preach. I can't talk to some people. I, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. I, I am a guy that tries to get by with as few words in a day as possible, kind of like Matt is today at times. Uh, and if I can get through the day and only say five words, it's a good day for me. I can't preach. Now, the rest of you are thinking, what happened? <laughs> You know, the reality is we can have lingering doubts. Can God use me? Will God work through this? Will God get me through this? Will God supply? Will God provide? Will God accomplish? And I think there's some things very quickly here this morning, and I say quickly. I just remind you, of Paul, when he wrote the letter to, to, to Philippi, halfway through the book, he said, finally, my brethren, and just kind of keep that in mind. Um, it, it, if Paul can do it, I guess I can do that as well. But as a reminder, up to this point, Korah has led a, a kind of an insurrection, so to use a common word of these days. He led an insurrection against Moses and Aaron. As you recall, the earth opened up, swallowed them up. 
And then uh, the representatives from all the tribes who were standing there with their torches, 250 of them, were consumed by the fire of God, and, and uh, quite a few were killed on that very day. On the next day, as we looked at last week, uh, after observing the earth literally opening up and swallowing all those that were rebelling against Aaron and Moses, as the very next day after watching the fire of God devour those who were holding out the, their scepters of fire, the very next morning they come to Aaron and Moses and accuse Aaron and Moses of murder, of having done some magical uh, thing to have allowed the earth to open up and swallow up and the fire of God to fall down upon these men. And in so doing, God one more time says to Moses, step back from them because I'm going to destroy them all. And Moses one more time falls on his knees and says, Lord, spare them. And we know that uh, there at the end of chapter 16, uh, the, the plague falls upon them and Moses sends Aaron into the midst of them to be a, a barrier between the living and the dead and ultimately establishing Aaron as the one who uh, not only is truly there by God, but truly is becoming one who stands between God and man uh, to, a, to a point. And uh, ultimately, we could say chapter 16 concluded with God making a very clear point. Aaron and Moses are my men. Uh, look what happened. Granted, there were, what, 14,700 men killed on that very day. But it was because of Aaron's effort standing in the midst of them between the dead and the living that there weren't more involved. And it established a, a position for Aaron. But I love chapter 17 because notice how it begins as I just read it. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This wasn't as a result of anything that had transpired. This wasn't a result of, uh, as far as we have recorded, continued murmuring. Uh, it seems as we concluded chapter 16, uh, the, the verdict has been defined, had been declared. God had made it very clear, Moses and Aaron are my men. And uh, there is death to those that the, dispute that to a point. It, it seems like chapter 16 concluded with a very valid, hey, I've established Aaron as my high priest. End of discussion. And if you want to argue, just remember Korah and all those other families involved. And remember the 14,700 men that were killed because they called into question what God was doing. But in chapter 17, Moses is approached by God. And in verse 2, God says, Speak unto the children of Israel and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers. Let me put in a dot, 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 that I might one more time show them who I am and who I have called so that there will be no more murmuring. In other words, so that will, there will be no more death. Uh, because of this. And, and so I think when there's times when we are doubting, God, can you use me? God, will you get me through this? God, will you be able to work through this circumstance that we're going through? Will you be able to find and, and show me that grace that is always sufficient, always running over? Will you be able to show me your mercy that is new every morning? Whatever the circumstance, when we have those lingering doubts, may we be reminded of the mercy of God. Mercy of God that came to Moses and said, ultimately, I'm reading between the lines here, so give me this liberty, but ultimately what it appears that God is saying is, Moses, I don't want to have to do that again. Moses, I do not want to have to judge the people because they are doubting your leadership. Moses, I don't want to have to see lives lost because of their rebellion against Aaron. Moses, I am coming before you because I want to establish once and for all so that there is no more debate, there is no more dispute, there are no more deaths involved that they all might know. Now you can say, well, how's that mercy? Well, it's mercy because up to this point, how many times that maybe we're at the number five, if I'm counting correctly, five times God has threatened to kill them all because of their rebellion. Five times they should have all been dead. But because of God's continued mercy and Aaron's or and Moses' request to spare them, now we have in chapter 17 God initiating the, the cause here and saying, all right, I'm going to do this for them. I'm going to do this so they don't have the ability to ask more questions. That, they, that is a surety in, in their minds. Remember as uh, old Thomas in the New Testament, actually before uh, COVID hit and we were going through the Gospels, we were right at the, the, the time frame of 
of uh, Christ appearing to Thomas after his resurrection. Unless I see, <laughs> and unless I can put my hand into those, that wound, I will not believe that he rose from the dead. And what a marvelous thing we see as our Lord and Savior made a point of coming to Thomas to show him. Thomas, behold. Thomas, take your hand and feel. Thomas, I am here for you. We have the illustration of, of Peter who had denied him three times and the Lord reconciles him three times on the beach. And I would dare say in, in our lives, we have probably had those very instances where the Lord comes before us in his mercy and says, here I am. <laughs> it's me. Trust me. Believe in me. Love me. And we've all had those circumstances of, of, of number chapter 17 where God in his mercy comes and tracks us down and says, I'm still here. I'm just asking that you wait on me, that you just trust in me. But we do still have those times of lingering doubt, do not? Uh, we do. I do. I, I don't believe that I'm the only one here in this room. We still have those times where, where we wonder. In uh, consideration of these verses, speak verse 2, speak unto the children of Israel and take every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers. Of all the princes, according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods, write thou every name upon his rod. A couple of points to, I think, are significant from this verse. Uh, first off, these rods are something of great significance, especially for wanderers, but even more so for each tribe, as, as the patriarchal figure of, of each tribe uh, would have, obviously many of them would have their own rods. But the rod of the patriarch of the tribe was of, of, of great importance, of great significance. Um, I think back to a uh, college graduation, uh, which ironically I skipped my own, but I've been to others. <laughs> um, as I think back in, in, at Maranatha, all the uh, uh, professors and uh, many of them with doctorate degrees walk in and they've got, I don't know what it's called, all that regalia, what's that, that hood or scarf or whatever that thing is that kind of hangs over their shoulders and, and uh, the colors and the number of colors all correlate to their degrees and and uh, I'm certainly not one of these guys that's all about colors and decorating and all that, but I often think to myself, what is up with all the colors? And as they're sitting there on the platform and you got one guy with, you know, uh, a blue and orange stripes and another guy with purple and green stripes and they're like, uh, the deal with the stripes, what the deal with the colors? And uh, I know you can go online and find it out and there may even be in their graduation pamphlet, it may even say uh, what each color and what each stripe means and it depends on the department and uh, extent of, of, uh, of education, but it certainly is, I'd have to acknowledge, that it certainly is one that is of, of awe. Throughout the year, you sit in the classroom being taught by those very professors, and they're just the teacher of that class. Some of them are great, and when I define in college terms, a, a great teacher is one that doesn't require you to do a lot, <laughs> and some of them are really hard. But in that graduation ceremony, as they come through with their robes and all of the extras, and, and you acknowledge, this guy has actually gone, he's faced the same classes and, and completed them. And he's gone well beyond that and completed them and has earned more letters after his name than are in my name, which Newshorn is a pretty lengthy name. There is great significance, as was that single rod. But I also find quite fascinating that it requests in verse 2 that they put their name on the rod. Now there would not have been two rods that would have been similar. They came from trees. There'd be no way that you could have two rods that would have been similar. I have to dare say that everybody would know their rod. In fact, probably, especially as, as uh, wanderers, now they're just going to be beginning their 40 years, but they've already been wandering for quite some time. Uh, the, undoubtedly, there are bloodstains that match the calluses on their hand as they've walked with that rod. And it was their rod. It was the family's rod. It was the tribe's rod of great significance. But they're being asked to put their name on it. Now, I don't know if you've all played this game. Uh, now as I'm an adult, I think it's a rather disgusting game, but kids loved it, and I recall liking it as well. Uh, I think in Awana, we play this game frequently. You gather, you know, in Awana you have the four teams, four color teams, and uh, kind of in a, a circle or square, depending on how it all works. 
and uh, you take off your right shoe and you throw it into the center of the gym. And then one at a time, the whistle will blow and the person on the end of each color team as they're kind of around the circle, uh, the first person runs in and they have to try to find their other match. And uh, so they're digging through this pile of, of shoes. You know, just imagine uh, 100 shoes, right-footed shoes, piled in a, and, and just imagine the first guy has got to deal with the wow stench of digging through that pile of shoes. I always kind of wanted to, oh, we're playing this game. You just kind of move down to the end of the line. When it gets down to me, there's only going to be four left. <laughs> One of those is mine. Uh, but I never was able to accomplish that. You know, when, when you run in there, certainly there's sometimes confusion. Sometimes there's uh, uh, aspects of there's a shoe that is kind of similar. But you know whose shoe is yours. You know the stains. You know the color. You might even know, disgustingly so, the stink <laughs> that's involved with your shoe, especially in the, uh, the guy's end of the uh, WANA program. Uh, I recall one time we played that game, and I ran, and I was about in the middle of the, the cycle, so half the shoes were already gone, and I ran out to the center to find my shoe. And uh, the three other that are competing against me had already found their shoe and were back on, back on their line, and the whole gym was waiting for me. Come on, all right, get your shoe, get your shoe. And I'm like, my shoe's not out here. I'm digging through them. There's, my shoe is not here. And, and my uh, team captain, the, uh, the adult that's in charge of my color, came out, and he's like, come on, what's going on? you got to get, get your shoe. We're all waiting for you. But like, my shoe's not here. Well, it's got to be here. So it's not here. And as I stood up to talk to him, I noticed somebody on the other team's wearing my shoe. And it's not even the same color as his other shoe. So I, I quick turn around and I see his pair and I grab and I walked over to them. Here's your shoe. Can I have mine? How, how does, I, I think it was something, I had a red shoe and he had a blue shoe and somehow he just grabbed my shoe and put it on. I think it was more about his understanding of the rules was see who can get back to the line first with a shoe on. Didn't matter what color or whose it was. And uh, here's that guy's wearing my shoe. Unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of money. I couldn't say, Mom, Dad, we need new shoes. <laughs> you know, this, I don't believe that this would have ever happened in real time, in, in real scenario, that a name would have been required for them to understand whose rod it was. They would have all known, like my shoe. They would have all known, that's my shoe. You can put a hundred shoes in the center. I can tell you that one's mine. You can put 12 rods together, and I can tell you all those 12 rods that one right there is mine, Rod. But I think there's of great importance and great significance that a name is being added. Verse 3, I think, kind of helps right, uh, explain that. Now shall I write Aaron's name. Aaron on Dolly was not the, uh, uh, the oldest, the senior, most senior member of the tribe of Levi. But God says on the tribe of Levi, make sure you write Aaron's name. Because it's not about the tribe that is of great significance here. It's about the name. It's about the man. Make sure, verse 3, you write Aaron's name on this rod. Now, there's great disagreement, and I'm not going to get into it, but are there 12 tribes involved? Here's a great question for you uh, to contemplate. How many tribes of Israel were there as a number 12 is given? Well, let me read if I can find that verse. Uh, where Thou shalt lay up, verse 4, in the congregation before the testimony, before I will meet with you. Uh, where we go? Oh, verse 6. And Moses spoke unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece for each prince, one according to their father's house, even twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron was among their rods. Does that mean there were twelve total or thirteen? If you think you come up with a confident number, I'll tell you this. Uh, you're going to have half of theologians disagreeing with you regardless <laughs> of what number you say. If you recall, Joseph had his tribe was split in two, remember? Uh, so of the 12 sons, ultimately, there were 13 tribes, and the tribe of Levi really didn't, as, as far as inheritance goes, didn't necessarily count. Um, but Aaron now is counting, and so it's either that there were the 12 tribes plus the tribe of Levi with Aaron's name on it, or the two tribes of, of uh, was it Ephraim and Manasseh of Joseph were combined as one, so that Aaron's would be number 12. Um, it doesn't tell us in verse 6. It's a great thing to contemplate in your mind, but I'll tell you this, you probably never come to a great conclusion, uh, because when it says that Aaron's was among their rods, does that mean he's one of the 12 or in addition to the 12? Just things to ponder, but truly do not have any significance for, for the point that we're trying to make. The mercy of God. Don't forget the mercy of God when you are faced with a scenario where you wonder, you have lingering doubts, 
Will God, can God. Remember the mercy of God. Secondly, consider the miracle of God. Verse 6, and Moses spake unto the children of Israel. I just read this. He gathered all the tribes, rods, 12 or 13, whichever number you want to go with. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, not surprisingly so, that's not, that's not written there, but I'm putting that in there. Not surprisingly so, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. Let me stop right there. You imagine the miracle that's involved, this rod. Remember Aaron's rod? This rod that undoubtedly Aaron and Moses had with them right after the burning bush, before going into Egypt, and then having all of those plagues being accomplished, so many of them from the, the rod of, of Aaron. Uh, remember that very rod that turned into a serpent and then back? Remember the rod that Aaron has carried with him for this entire journey this rod that has been as dead as a dead could be as far as a rod goes is now budding. There's, there's miracle number one. A dried out rod, a dried out stick is blossoming. Ha, that's a miracle of our God. But here's the other aspect of the miracle of our God. It says in the end of verse 8, not only was it budded and brought forth buds, but it also bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. There's an impossibility. Now, I'm not an almond uh, uh, tree, uh, what do you call that, expert? But I've got to think that if something is budding and blossoming and bearing fruit all the same time, just overnight, there is no natural scientific explanation for that. You've got three time frames, the, the bud, the blossom, and the fruit that have all transpired overnight that only God could do. Now, is God today still doing that kind of a miracle? Is God today still doing budding and blossoming and bearing fruit to show you that, you know, wouldn't it be great as, as churches to have a, 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 a pastoral search committee? Everybody bring your rod and I will make one bud blossom and bear fruit and that will be your man. Wouldn't that be great for churches that are looking for pastors? <laughs> I think there's a lot of very large churches that have a lot of Struggle because the more people you have involved, the more decision makers there are, and, and the more uh, uh, opinions there are. And uh, uh, boy, who are we supposed to pick for our next man to lead this church? Oh, it'd be great if God still did stuff like that. Bring your rod, I'll make one bloom overnight. Here's your answer. It's done, done deal, good to go. Let's move on. But, but the truth is, is God does still do miracles, does He not? Does God not still do things that stand, make us stand back in awe and say, only God could do that. That could only be God. Now, he doesn't necessarily work in the same ways he did in the Old Testament because we have the entirety of his word and we don't need any more to know and understand God's will for our lives. But he still is a God of miracles. He is still a God that does the impossible. He is still the God that we have to stand back and say, that's not normal. <laughs> that, that should not have normally taken place. That, that is not how things normally go. That is only God. And Moses, verse 9, brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel, and they looked. I love that word, looked. Could you imagine, almost with hopeful eyes, they didn't ask for this final test. They didn't ask for God to do this, show us one more time. This was all God presenting this to them. But the word there, looked, has that idea that all of them are with anticipation whose rod budded overnight. And one by one, perhaps, and I don't know how this goes, but I'm guessing as they call out tribe after tribe, here's your rod, here's your rod, here's your rod. But as everyone is being handed out, it's very obvious there's one rod that not only has changed its form from the night before, but it's got buds, blossoms, and fruit on it. There's somebody who's saying, we can make some almond bread out of this thing. There's, there's fruit on that rod. The miracle that God accomplished in one night cannot be ignored. And there are things that our God does for us that should not be ignored. If you have lingering doubts, which we all will have those, God, can you use me? God, will you provide in this scenario? Lord, do you have a purpose and a plan in this? There are times that we're going to be having lingering doubts. But we need to be not only be reminded of God's mercy that is renewed every morning, but we need to be reminded of the, God's 
miracles that he continues to do today. If we but know them and see them and, and acknowledge them. Remember, uh, but for a, uh, a spastic paralysis boy, there'd be a lot of men who would not have been in the ministry. But one boy spoke seven words and a heart was tenderized. A heart was broken. A heart was brought to a complete understanding of their God in a new way from seven words. And it changed their lives. That is a God of miracle. That is a God that still does the impossible. That is a God that still desires to show us that he is still here. He is still alive. He is still powerful. You know, uh, uh, if you want to know a miracle, this, if you have a Bible in your lap right now, this right here is a miracle. The very reality of, of his word. You know how many nations and people groups have tried to destroy this? You know how old this is, just to begin with. Imagine a book being able to survive generation after generation after generation. Imagine a book that has been translated in more languages than any other book and still just as much powerful and alive as it was from the get-go. Imagine a book that has been destroyed and people's lives have been burned at stakes because of this book, and yet it continues on. All the stories and the illustrations that can be given of, of, of powerful men doing all they can within their might to stop the power of this book, and we hold it in our laps today. You want to know a miracle of our God? You don't have to even look at yesterday's events. Look at the word of God in your lap. This is a mighty example of a budding rod, so to speak. A mighty example of what God is still doing today so that we would still know what he has for us. But even this, to be humble enough to say, even though we have all that we need for our life and our godliness, as Peter says, do we not still read some of these words and doubt that they still work today? Do we not see the quote-unquote budding rod? Now, I'm not trying to make a parallel of Aaron's rod to the word of God. I'm not trying to make that parallel. But if we could use this as an example of a miracle, do we not see the budding rod and still question, does this still work for me today? Do you still have lingering doubts? Well, remember God's mercy. But remember God's miracle that he's doing constantly around us in ways that we never probably ever imagined. Lastly, and let me explain this one because it's going to seem very similar to number two. The mercy of God, the miracle of God, and the might of God. Now, let me quickly explain the difference because miracle and might really go hand in hand. Because of God's might, we have miracles. Uh, miracles show God's might. The miracle of God is, we'll say, more of an active aspect from God as far as my point is considered here. Uh, we need to have that we need to have the acknowledgement of God's active working in our lives through miracles of what he is still accomplishing today. He is a God that is still alive. He is still powerful. And he's still doing things that are impossible. And, and when we have those lingering doubts, just remind ourselves that this God has not changed. But from the passive side, as far as God goes, from the active side, as far as we go, we need to then acknowledge, as we see his action, his miracles, we need to acknowledge his might. And, and so this is almost the same point, one from God's perspective, his action, now from our perspective, our action, acknowledging his might. I don't know if I read all these verses. We started with all these verses. Let me pick up in verse 9 again. It says, And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto the children of Israel, and they looked and looked, took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt... Uh, quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. Moses store up Aaron's rod that is budding, that it might be a constant testimony. You know, can you imagine just someone ever, from that point on, ever questions the authority of, of Aaron? Hey, have you seen his rod? <laughs> uh, you got a question? Let me show you his rod. God has purposely done what he has accomplished in chapter 17 so that for the rest of time, he'd only have to point to that rod and say, do you see the rod? That was God. Only God could do that. It was God that chose him. See the rod. And so he, Moses is told, store that up. And Moses did so, verse 11. So the Lord commanded him, so did he. And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, 
Now, here's a second conflict in this chapter of which great theologians, much smarter than I, disagree in great ways. What is the tone? Sometimes you wish you could understand tone in written word, right? And uh, the tone can make a, a big difference. Uh, I know that uh, uh, in email, uh, emojis aren't professional. They're not, uh, what I'm trying to say, office worthy, so to speak. Uh, but a lot of times I find myself putting a lot of emojis in because I want to make sure that people understand my tone. And I'm trying to be funny here. I'm not, I'm not being, I'm, I'm not like slapping you in the face. I'm trying to be funny here. And I'll put a big smiley face. Uh, because you can't acknowledge tone in, in writing. But look at, look at, try to figure out the tone. Well, let me say you this way. When we get to the end, it's not going to matter anyway. But try to figure out the tone. Verse 12. And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. It almost seems to be that the words there connect back to, We die as Korah and his family die. We perish as all 14,700 just the day before perish because of that plague. And then we all perish. In other words, all that are left, we have no hope. There, we will all die. Whosoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Shall we be consumed with dying? Now, some may argue, well, that was a sign of repentance. Those words are acknowledging, hey, we're not doing that anymore. We understand now that God has chosen Aaron, and we dare not doubt that or argue against that lest we die. We understand that. Some would argue that basically what they're saying is, well, so God's just going to kill us all anyway, so what's, what's the deal? Uh, we're done for. Uh, we don't know the tone. Uh, uh, the words as they're recorded for us seem to be a little more that it's not necessarily a true repentance, but more of a, who are we now? Uh, we acknowledge that God has chosen Aaron. We acknowledge that uh, to rise up against Aaron is going to be pointless for us. So what's the point now for us? Is what it seems. I can tell you the rest of the story, you know, the, the Paul, Horry, Re, Paul Harvey rest of the story. From this point on, Aaron's position was never doubted again. So whatever happened, whatever the tone is of these verses, whether it be sarcasm of, well, great, now we can never say anything about this guy. Oh, this is going to be dead anyway. Or whether what truly was, we now understand and we come humbly before a God that if, if, if we don't grasp God in this, we will die. And it is one of repentance. I, I don't know which one it is. But I know that it had an impact on the rest, <laughs> had an impact on the rest of their lives, the rest of the story. Aaron's role is now established. Now, will they continue to murmur? Yes. Will they continue to have things to complain about? Absolutely. Do we? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but it seems from this point forward that Aaron's role in his position that God had appointed him is, is without debate, without, without uh, a discussion, as far as it truly being that God establishes. They may still argue, we don't want him, or we don't like what he's doing. Uh, but the argument of, did God put him there? That, that, that discussion is, is done. There will always be times in our lives that we will have lingering doubt. There will always be circumstances in our lives that we will wonder, Lord, what are you doing? I know some of us, even in 2020, we faced, uh, many of us faced those very circumstances here this last year. And it would be easy to ask, Lord, what, how are you, how? Well, not that we're doubting that there is a God, not that we're doubting that he's a loving God, not that we're doubting that he's even a merciful God, but Lord, how are you, how, how, what is your point here? What are you going to accomplish through this? How am I going to get through this? And, and there's going to be some lingering doubts. And, and I, I'm not going to argue against that. I, I think that is certainly the case. But lest we find ourselves defeated by the circumstance, may we be constantly reminded of God's renewed mercy on our behalf day after day after day. It doesn't mean we have to understand the circumstance. It doesn't mean we have to have all the answers. But may we be reminded of his renewed mercy for me, for you. May we be renewed in our understanding of our God is a mighty God and he has the power to do as he desires to do, period. May we be reminded of that. And then from our perspective, may we stand in awe of the might, the powerful might of our God, who back in this day was able to make a dead stick, not only bud, 
but blossom and bear fruit overnight. But in our day, he's the same God that has the same power. And when we have those lingering doubts, as we will, when we have those moments like Thomas and say, lust I put my eyes upon him and put my hands in that, lest we have those times like Peter where we wonder, Lord, I have failed you and will I ever be able to be used by you again? May we be reminded of a God who makes it clear his mercy, his miracle, and his might. And may we be able to grasp the amazing aspect of Numbers chapter 17. Let's close. Lord, we thank you again for your word. I thank you for the very fact that you are a God that does not change. I thank you that there are times in our life where you allow us to go through circumstances that are not easy. But I pray that we be able to watch our thinking, to be able to ask ourselves, hey, what am I thinking? Are we thinking on things that are true and honest? Or are we thinking on things that are all the what ifs and worst cases and uh, come to conclusions that leave you out of the equation? I pray that when we have those lingering doubts, as the children of Israel did, that we be reminded of who you are and what you are all still doing today. And I pray that all at times it may take us some time, it may take us some work, it may take some commitment on our parts in, in directing our thoughts in the right direction, refocusing our eyes upon you. But I pray that we be honored, that you be honored as we fix our eyes upon you and stand in awe of you, even come what may. And we thank you for what you will do and how you will do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.